grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I am Reverend Carson Overstreet, and it truly is a joy and a privilege to serve as pastor with this community of faith. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It is the day of the birthday of the early church, and so we celebrate. We remember the story as told in the book of Acts, chapter 2, that as the disciples were gathered together in one place, the Spirit of God came like a rush of a mighty wind and rested upon each disciple gathered as a tongue of fire to ignite their faith in God's energy, intelligence, imagination, and love so that they may further Christ's ministry of reconciliation into the wider world. Today we stand in that tradition, and yet we come with grieving hearts that we cannot be gathered together in the same place to sing happy birthday to the church. The session of Van White Presbyterian Church met this past week, and through prayerful discernment, we have decided to continue our online worship through the month of June. Please rest assured that our elders will be gathering together early this month of June to begin making plans and procedures for us to enter back into phases of in-person worship as soon as we feel that the time is right and safe for our community to gather In the meantime, I pray that this service of worship would renew your faith and the sure and certain knowledge that God is with us. Let us worship God. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let us praise the Lord. Let us join in one voice, praising God singing all people that on earth do dwell. Lord God, you have bestowed upon your people a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. You call us to varieties of services, but through the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Forgive us when we restrict the movement of your spirit. When we are confused by uncertainty and fear, direct our steps by your will so that your purposes of peace, justice, and reconciliation may be accomplished through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the assurance of pardon. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Friends, believe the good news. Through the sacrament of baptism, we share in Jesus dying 
and rising to new life. Know that you and I are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'd like to wish a special welcome to all of our younger disciples today. Boy, I miss having you here in the sanctuary when we have the children's message. And you always have something important to share with me and the congregation, and you always find a way to make us smile. So I miss seeing you. But on this um, special day, it is Pentecost. And some of you may remember that Pentecost actually stands for the number 50, 50 days. It was 50 days since Jesus Christ rose from the dead of Easter Sunday, and 50 days from Easter Sunday till the day that the Holy Spirit arrived. Um, Jesus promised that the Advocate, that Holy Spirit would come and teach us all that he had commanded so today is the day of the birth of the church as Holy Spirit arrives. And Holy Spirit came like a rush of mighty wind and rested on each disciple like flames of fire to give them inspiration um, to imagine what God may be doing in the world. I love the story of Pentecost because all those who received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they spoke in different languages. And I think that a part of the story celebrates the diversity that we have in all the many cultures that we know of around us. I also love the day of Pentecost, not just because we get to sing happy birthday to the church, but also because um, Luke's telling of the birthday of the church reminds us of an important prophecy that the prophet Joel told in the Old Testament. And it says that your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And it reminds me especially that our children of the church have a beautiful way of seeing God at work in the world. And I hope that you continue to tell us where you see God and where you could imagine us continuing to follow Jesus and loving one another. You have so much to teach us. And I just pray that you continue doing that. You inspire each of us in our faith, us adults. So don't stop dreaming, my friends. Let's sing happy birthday to the church. And I wish I could hear you with me, but let's sing. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear church, happy birthday to you, happy Pentecost. Before we enter into God's word today, let us pray. Almighty God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Speak to us in the language of our hearts, that we may hear your word with understanding and answer your call with confidence. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. When life becomes disorienting, where do we turn, church? We turn to Jesus. We turn to the word made flesh. We turn to scripture because God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. These past seven weeks of Easter season, we've been learning how to share the gospel at a distance through the eyes of the Apostle Paul. We are not the first Christians to experience physical separation from God's house, nor physical separation from one another. In fact, much, much of Paul's ministry was shared at a distance as he wrote letters of encouragement and direction to his flocks. Today, the Spirit of God is situating us in Paul's correspondence with the Corinthians. When the Apostle Paul founded 
the church in Corinth. He stayed there for one year and six months, teaching and preaching the word of God to them. Paul then left for Ephesus while his colleague Apollos stayed behind. And it was during his absence that the church in Corinth had so many questions, especially regarding conflict. And so Paul wrote to them in those first and second letters to address the various issues that the congregation was raising. It was during Paul's second visit to Corinth that he was deeply hurt by an individual. Now, the man's identity and particular actions, they are not named in Scripture. But the offense hurt the congregation. Yet they did not rebuke the offender nor the offense. It's unclear if this individual was even a disciple of the Corinthian church. As a result, Paul wrote an emotionally charged letter of tears to the Corinthians on handling the matter. And after the congregation addressed the conflict with the individual, Paul sent Titus to follow up. And this is where we enter into the text today of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 4 through 16. And I invite you to listen for God's word to us today. Paul said, I often boast about you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with consolation. I am overjoyed in all our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way, disputes without and fears within. But God, who consoles the downcast, consoled us by the arrival of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was consoled about you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that I grieved you with that letter though only briefly. Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you felt a godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. What earnestness to clear yourselves. What indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves guiltless in this matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who was wronged but in order that your zeal for us might be made known to you before God. In this we find comfort. In addition to our own consolation, we rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus, because his mind has been set at rest by all of you. For if I have been somewhat boastful about you to him, I was not disgraced. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting to Titus has proved true as well. And his heart goes out all the more to you as he remembers the obedience of all of you and how you welcomed him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some have said the Apostle Paul was a hothead. He was passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was also passionate that the church get it right. There was a lot at stake for Paul to proclaim the gospel message of the crucified and risen Christ. According to Paul, 
conflict and unresolved grief could easily lead to division. And any division, any disunity compromised the integrity of Jesus' ministry of reconciliation that was poured out on the cross. Therefore, Paul created a space for the church to name its grief. Paul wanted to foster Christ's healing and wholeness and reconciliation so that they could take steps forward. Paul led the Corinthians to distinguish the difference between worldly grief and godly grief. Worldly grief is a passive reaction to hurt. It is a sorrow that remains embedded within. Worldly grief has negative effects on our hearts individually and also communally. It's a grief that throws its hands up saying, that is so sad, but there's nothing we can do about it. It's a grief that resolves to do nothing. And yet worldly grief can so easily infect a community and lead to resentment and division. And in Paul's words, worldly grief produces death. But godly grief, godly grief is wholly different. It is channeling sorrow and pain for God's purposes. Paul says that godly grief produces an eagerness to seek out and obey God's priorities. Godly grief defends the gospel of Jesus Christ and the costly grace of the cross. It strikes a chord with righteous anger. Godly grief stirs up our faith with eager longing for God's kingdom to come and for God's saving promises to be more fully realized. Godly grief can step on your toes, church, by overturning our lukewarm faith to faith that is set on fire for God and God's coming kingdom. And Paul's words really speak into the life of the church in our context today. Pastors across this country and across the world recognize the collective grief our world is experiencing right now. Pastors like myself are grieving too. We grieve for the families who have lost loved ones due to this coronavirus pandemic. In our country alone, over 100,000 people have died. We grieve the division that has resulted from politicizing this global health crisis. We grieve being physically separated as a community of faith, even as we do so from a standpoint of love, to love our neighbor as ourselves. I recognize that some... Some Christians lament that their churches are being overly cautious by continuing to worship online. While some Christians are lamenting that churches are being uh, not cautious enough by reinstating in-person gatherings, some are saying it's too soon. And as Paul challenges his congregation, so I challenge each of us Do not allow worldly grief to seize your heart. I do not want worldly grief to seize my heart. The church universal cannot allow our collective grief to lead to further disunity because of this pandemic. It compromises the integrity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not let this pandemic divide the church. Paul says in his book, uh, rather letter, to the Philippians, let us not look to our own interest, but to the interest of others. Let us seek the mind of Christ. And yet in the midst of all of this, 
the sin of racism is rearing its ugly face again. This pandemic is uncovering racial injustice towards our Asian and black brothers and sisters. And the church is called to denounce racism. To quote one of my colleagues in ministry, anything that separates us from God and one another must be examined, confessed, and repaired. This is the work of godly grief. I do not have all the answers as to how to reconcile the sin of racism, which has oppressed our brothers and sisters of color for centuries. But I do know that as a white, moderate Christian, I have work to do. And in fact, the Lord requires each one of us that says that we follow the Lord, we follow Jesus Christ. Each one of us is required to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and God's Spirit is on the move to set our faith on fire for God's mission of reconciling the world because we know the world is not as it should be. And I will tell you that the Holy Spirit of Pentecost arrives to us today even to step on our toes and to challenge us to, in fact, practice the faith that we profess. I pray that the Lord would move our faith to take a posture of godly grief. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. God's promised deliverance is that salvation. And it does not bring regret, as Paul says. So let us lift our voices and name the godly grief that we have. Let us join together, seeking the mind of Christ to do the work of godly grief for there are many that are waiting for us to do so. In the name of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Join me in responding to God's word, singing Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness.
Church family, I want to take a moment to say thank you. We continue to find holy experiments to serve in mission and come alongside our neighbors in this difficult time. And Lancaster Children's Home is one of our ministry partners. Um, we have been finding ways to come alongside them and reach out to their youth. Recently, they shared a need of basketball shorts for their youth. And I am so proud of Van White Presbyterian Church. We had a drive-through donation um, just a few days ago. And your generosity has added up to 48 pairs of basketball shorts for these amazing youth and also a good amount of monetary donations. We haven't counted that yet, but I just want to thank you for being a church that cares for the community around us. I know that the youth at Lancaster Children's Home are going to be thrilled as many of these are brand new shorts. So thank you for your love and compassion for those in need. Let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer together for our world. And following our prayer for our community, we will join our voices as one with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. For the church throughout the world, Almighty God, hear our prayer. Inspire the sons and daughters of your church for a prophetic witness to your truth. And upon old and young, give clarity of vision to acknowledge your saving power in the world. For nations of the world and its leaders, Lord God, overcome the babbling of misunderstanding among the nations and let all people hear in their own language and recognize in their own culture your unifying message of love. For those in need of healing, Lord God, we pray you will send your healing spirit upon those who are sick in body or mind, restore them to health, and restore to them the joy of salvation. Lord, we grieve with the families who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. We grieve with the families who have lost loved ones to racial injustice and hatred. Lord God, we pray for our neighbors and members of our civic community. Teach us to be good neighbors to live in peace with one another, and in friendship, share the joys and burdens of daily life. For all our children, bless them, Lord. Protect them from danger, and help parents and caregivers nurture them so that they may mature in wisdom and grow in your grace. For our enemies, Lord God, we pray that you would bless them and show us how that we may do good to them for the sake of Jesus Christ. In your mercy, almighty God, receive our prayers and according to your wisdom, provide all that we need through Jesus Christ, the one who taught his disciples and us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, with thanksgiving for God's gift to us, let us offer ourselves and the fruits of our labor for God's work in the world. I offer this prayer of dedication as we return our gifts to God. Almighty God, we have opened our hands to you, and our hands have been filled with good things. Receive the gifts that we bring in gratitude for your care for us 
and help us to bless you with dedication of our lives through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Friends, now go with a bold assurance that through this gift of faith, our God is certainly able to do far more than we can ever hope, ask for, or imagine. And may the love of an amazing God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the abiding flame of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every single moment of your life. Amen.